Hello and welcome back to day four of Bitwise, where we make a uh, software hardware stack for a computer from scratch. Um, so last week we ended up um, we ended up with a simple expression calculator and parser at the end, and uh, then we had a three-day weekend, and uh, and now we're back. Uh, I took a day off to to do nothing involving technical stuff, so I'm kind of fully recharged and eager to jump right back in. So just quickly go over some some admin stuff. Um, as I wrote in this note um, that I wrote on, on Friday, uh, from now on we'll be doing, the only regular streams will be semi-daily, so today will be the first, uh, the first, I guess, new instance of that rule. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday will be the regular streams as the same as the previous times. Uh, and then there will probably be random bonus streams, um, and those won't necessarily be at any particular time. Uh, this will be whenever it makes sense for me to do some, if I feel like them. All right. Uh, other news, uh, we have a forum now. So if you go to this link, um, we have uh, we have a forum on Handmade Network. And so if you have uh, questions, you want to discuss homework, you want to just discuss random stuff related to the project or anything indirectly related to the project, this is a good place to go. Um, this is probably the right place to have open-ended discussions rather than, you know, issues or pull requests on GitHub, so we can kind of centralize everything there. Um, what else? Uh, there's a new, some people have been asking for this, there's a new uh, alternative option for downloading uh, videos if you don't want to use YouTube. Uh, this also lets you get slightly higher quality videos since this is uh, serving directly what I'm recording to disk, so they're not transcoded on YouTube. Um, so you can see how to get that on this link. And uh, uh, Martins has also helped me generate a standalone audio files from those video files. So some people were saying they'd like to have a sort of podcast format where they can just listen to the audio if they're commuting or working in the background or whatever. Uh, and so those are available there as well. Uh, I'll maybe look into hosting the audio files on SoundCloud or something like that in the future. But for now, you can go get them there. Um, uh, other sort of t coming soon, uh, advertisement, uh, we're probably going to get annotated videos soon, uh, indexed and annotated videos. Um, so I've been in talks with, um, uh, with some folks about that and I'll make some, some definite announcements once we're there, but, uh, just know that this is coming real soon, hopefully. Um, so yeah, uh, I, even though I had a weekend, I did actually, uh, make a small commit on Saturday. And so before we jump into today's topics, uh, let's look at the diff for that and just quickly go over it. Um, this is mostly just, I think one actual fix and then mostly just cleanup. So if you, so let, I'll just quickly go through it. If you remember from the last stream, we had an issue where, um, when we tried to use a C99 compound literal in the second argument of a buff push, there was an issue with the C preprocessor not knowing about curly brace, braces and commas, uh, that the fact that curly braces uh, are actually nestings, and so it shouldn't interpret that comma inside it as a macro parameter des uh, delimiter. Uh, and so I found a workaround for that, which is just using C99 var args, and you know, you may or, this may be a little bit hack. I guess this was already in the code. So I guess I already pushed this. So I did something else. But anyway, that was another change that I don't think I explained on stream. So good to, good to explain it anyway. But this is just using var args in order to work around that nasty issue. Um, another thing I added is I added some, uh, not, not real overflow handling in the grow function, but at least some asserts so that if we're running in debug, we should detect overflows. Um, this is just, I mean, you can't really do overflow checks everywhere in your code base, uh, at least in C, which doesn't have any language support for it. But um, this is an example of some very lightweight, at least kind of tripwire stuff you can set up with asserts uh, if, if you're at least just trying to, to set up some tripwires for it. But this is not really what you should be using in production. But at least this is an example of how, um, let me, let me just write this in the text editor so you guys know. Um, if you guys don't know how to do overflow checks safely, um, so the thing this is guarding against is the fact that one plus buff cap buff may actually be greater than, uh, may be greater than uh, size max. Mathematically, that is. In other words, if you calculated this left-hand side expression with perfect 
you know, arbitrary precision, uh, this might be bigger than size max, in which case it's going to wrap around. So rather than making a big allocation, it's just going to wrap around to a small allocation and things can fail downstream. Certainly a bunch of invariants will be broken. Um, so, so if you want to check for this, you can't actually write this in code because this is always true uh, with, because size max is literally the largest possible integer representable in this type. So you definitely don't want to write this. Uh, the compiler sh should actually warn you if you write this. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it should. Uh, I'm not going to check right now, but uh, it should warn you about this because it's, it's always true. So what you actually want to write is you want to rewrite this using your middle school algebra skills and say this is equivalent to, um, well, let's write it in a few steps. This is equivalent to this by subtracting one, and then it's uh, equivalent to this. And so you can see this is the this expression here is the right hand side. Uh, there's no overflow. We're taking the max possible value. We're subtracting one. That's still not that's not underflowing or anything. Then we're dividing by two. That's also fine. Uh, and the left hand side is just an existing quantity in that type. And so there's no issue there either. Uh, and here we're just asserting that it's actually within those bounds. So uh, we'll be doing this later today for overflow checking in our lexer. But uh, that's the basic transformation of taking a mathematical equation and turning it into something actually implementable. And you'll note that it turns the multiply into a divide. And so sometimes, I mean, if you have a critical path and you want to do overflow checking, you suddenly have a divide. And that can sometimes be unfortunate. But um, in the case of a division by two, of course, it's, it's quite cheap. It's just a shift. But anyway, um, so that's what that is. And there's another one here for the uh, size of calculation. Um, then there's just some cosmetic cleanup I don't want to talk about. Um, I added a new uh, buff end accessor, um, which is convenient for iteration loops. So rather than doing all this index based looping, you just have a pointer based uh, delimiter for the end of the, you know, the used portion of the buffer. And so rather than doing uh, this kind of thing, we are doing now this kind of thing, which is maybe if you're, yeah, this is more like pointer arithmetic rather than index arithmetic. Um, so so less, less repetitiveness, um, not really faster because the compilers can all do this transformation under the hood, but it's certainly less typing and less repetition. So, uh, and just cleaner, I think. So uh, small one-liner improvement. Um, and this, I guess I just renamed the struct and what else? Uh, another thing someone pointed out is uh, this is the actual fix on, uh, on this commit. Um, we did this token kind name function just for error printing. And it, I even warned preemptively that this returns a pointer to a static internal buffer, so it'll be overridden next call. But then I proceeded to actually use it in one of the functions in a way that would use it so it's overwritten. And so that was printing a spurious message. And so I we'll do something slightly different from this in the long term, but for now, without changing the existing code too much, I factored this into two separate functions, one which uh, rather than filling in an internal buffer copies to a user provided buffer. So you provide a, a destination pointer and the size of that destination buffer. Uh, and then it uses SN printf to safely print into that and returns the size of that at the end, if you, in case you want to use that return value. And then the old function is now just a sort of wrapper around that, still has the same semantics. You still have to be uh, careful to use it. Um, so you can see in this case, it just calls this function, copies into its internal buffer, uh, actually asserts that uh, that the static buffer has enough space. Because we're using SNPrintf, this is actually not a safety uh, check. This is really just a correctness check in a broader sense because SNPrintf is always going to zero terminate uh, the buffer. So we don't have to worry about that classic uh, issue. Um, but this is basically just making sure that we didn't truncate the error message because that would, I mean, that, that would not be a, like a serious issue, but it would still be a bug. So I'm just putting that in there as a good mental habit. Uh, in addition, I just cleaned up the actual layout of the switch loop. We're still going to have a switch and you will see why today because today we'll be adding a lot more cases to the Lexer and it's nice to have a single switch. Uh, but I just basically collapsed uh, 10 cases to each line so that it's more compact ver vertically. Um, what else? Yeah, replace the old token stuff with new. Um, I, I added actual tests for the Lexer. 
Um, so rather than just having this thing that runs through the token stream but doesn't actually check that the values are correct, I'm now actually asserting that the tokens and the token semantics are as expected. Um, let's see, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, other than that, it's just some cosmetic cleanup. All right, so that's just the catch up for that diff. Um, so let's jump in. Actually, let me, let me talk about now about what, what I want to do today. Um, last week, we didn't get all that much code done uh, compared to my expectations because it ended up that the best use of, I think, my time and just the stream in general was to kind of prep people from, for some of what was to come with a compiler. Um, and so I think that was the right use of time, but it does mean that I think we should get a little more heads down this week now that we have the, the basic prereqs out of the way and people have um, hopefully had a chance to think about or work on their homework so that some of these ideas are not totally alien. And as you see me just applying them, you'll be able to sort of say, aha, I know what that is. Uh, I, I saw that before. So uh, I'm not just sort of uh, showing you stuff you, you have no clue about. So yeah, the, the plan today is I'm actually going to be coding all day. Uh, I'll be coding on stream as much as possible until I, I collapse, I guess, until I get too tired or uh, I lose my focus too much. Um, so the plan is basically we'll do a one and a half hour stream or so uh, for the main video on YouTube. And uh, I'll do a Q&A at the end of that uh, segment. And then I will stop the recording, make a new recording and continue streaming and uh, doing coding on that stream. So uh, I think one difference from last time is uh, because I want to be a little more focused on coding and also because my voice last week um, was pretty destroyed, I'm going to do slightly less talking at least today and focus more on coding. Uh, and then we'll see how much we can get done that way. And as the uh, topic of today, uh, of today says, the plan is to do the ion lexer parser and AST today. Uh, we won't be able to do 100%, but we should be able to do a very broad slice of all of those, um, assuming I don't completely uh, get stuck on something, which I don't think I will, but let's see. So um, with that out of the way, let's just jump right in. So I guess the first thing is I'm just going to remove all the parsing stuff because all of this was really just kind of demo uh, demo code for, uh, for the topics we were covering last week. So that's number one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm gonna have to mute. Excuse me. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. So, um, um, the plan is to start doing something more like the real Lexer. And so, so far, we only really did um, three broad classes of tokens. We have <clears throat> we have integers, and we have identifiers, and then we have sort of single character tokens. So for the real ion language, we'll need basically everything we have in C and then a couple more, more or less. So uh, we'll need to do quite a bit more. And so I'm going to, um, let's see, what's the shortcut? Oh, that is the shortcut. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's just call this syntax. And uh, I'm just going to start making kind of a list of the syntactic inventory that we'll need and uh, start writing some, you know, grammar, uh, some grammar rules for them to just sort of start collecting them. And I'll, I'll probably forget about a bunch, but um, this will be a good start. So I'm, I'm just going to start writing some things down. Um, so there's a bunch of some like things. Well, and it includes those. Um, so let's say binary. Um, and uh, 
<clears throat> comparators. This. So we don't need these. Uh, for ternary and for unary, we will need plus minus um, uh, not bitwise not add resolve dereference. Um, Um, let me just write some others up here. Um, let's say there's some assignment like things which are like <clears throat> let's see uh, the so let's just go through that list. And so that those are good starting points, and then we also need um, what we call name, and a name starts with an alphabetic or an underscore followed by uh, one or more alphabetics underscores or digits. Um, we have an integer, which can be either decimal, in which case it has to start with a non-zero digit, followed by one or more non-zero digits, or it can be hex, in which case um, it has to um, start with zero, followed by upper or lowercase x, followed by a digit or a hexadecimal, well, hex digit. Um, and let's just say that's a good starting point for that. So I just want to have more than decimal. Just like my general approach for completeness with a lot of what we're doing is I won't necessarily handle every case, even if I can think of that case up front, but I want to at least handle sort of more than the trivial thing. So for example, the trivial thing in, in, in quotes is the decimal stuff, but let's also do the hexadecimal, uh, because that will reveal some common, some similarities between those two cases that can maybe be factored out. Um, we should also have uh, character literals, which are like, um, I guess we'll write them like, like this, since we're using quote syntax also here. Uh, and then it's either, I guess, I don't know what the right way to write this. And it's going to be a little bit ugly because of all the escaping we're going to have to do. Um, but basically, a character can either be a literal character or it can be a, a, an escape. Um, so I'm not sure what the best way. I guess you can say either um, either not escape, and this is not, I think, the, the only thing that can't be here. I guess you can also not have a new line, but let's just say that for now. Um, not escape, or it has to be uh, escape followed by, well, let's not do backslash x for now. Let's do the standard there, like n, r, t, b, v, b, a, or something like that. Um, and uh, then we also have a notion of a quoted string and starts with a double quote and then I mean basically anything I guess you can say other than a double quote um, maybe not yeah let's maybe not be too strict about it at this level let's just say any character uh, and in this case let's say anything other than that one or more of those and then I think it's almost easier in code to work out the specific grammar for some of these escapes. So I'm just going to leave it a little more loose here for now. 
And similarly here, we're just gonna say uh, open quote, one or more uh, non-open quotes, and then a close quote or a, yeah, something like that. Um, and for some of these, I'm going to assign uh, Uh, I'm going to assign names to them that match what we'll have in the code. And so I'll, I'll call this colon assign. I will call this uh, add assign. Set assign. I'm just going to do this for the multi-character uh, tokens. Um, by the way, uh, I kind of intentionally didn't come prepared with a fully prepared grammar because I wanted you to see how you can pretty easily develop this uh, incrementally. In our case, it's going to be especially easy because we know that we're going to match C in pretty much every area except for specific deviations. And so you can use your understanding as a C programmer to sort of drive the initial, um, you know, additional production of these cases and then you can, you know, you can uh, look up things online to verify the edge cases that maybe you're not totally sure about and that's more or less what we'll be doing as well. So I want you to see how you can just kind of build up this stuff incrementally uh, w without just, uh, yeah, pretty easily. And of course I'll make mistakes, but we'll fix them along the way. All right, so something like this is reasonable. So um, I guess the first thing to note, and this, this should be familiar if you've done homework too, is that you have to handle two character tokens that are extensions of single character tokens. So for example, if you see a less than character, you don't know whether it's a single standalone less than or a the beginning of a L shift. So you need to somehow handle that in your lexer. Uh, you can definitely do this in different ways. I'm going to use a, a way that builds in a pretty straightforward way on the existing switch structure we have. Um, so uh, that's what I'm gonna be doing. Uh, so uh, basically, we'll still have this case here for things that are not don't have any extensions as two character tokens, but that will probably be the minority. Um, but um, so I'm actually just going to I'm trying to remember what's the no, that's not what I'm looking for. I almost never use Windows as split stuff. All right, that's not the split direction I wanted. Uh, all right, 
let's not do that. Actually, let's just bring this some of this stuff into the, the, the C file itself. So, all right. Um, so let's put all the general stuff at the top, and and actually, let's not hmm, let's not do these because these are kind of rote. Um, let's do the interesting cases first, which are the stuff down here. We already have the beginning of some of it. Um, right, so let's do that. So we currently just have this decimal parsing. Um, by the way, I added overflow checking to this too, but it's using insert rather than something proper. So we'll need to fix that as well. Um, actually, a good start before we actually do that. Let's... Is that proper overflow handling? And I'm not going to be very good about um, the messages themselves necessarily. They're just going to be descriptive, like they're they're going to be identifiable, but not like super helpful at this point. Um, and then if that happens, let's just say val is zero. We just jump out of the loop. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to skip the remainder of the digits and then just jump out. So right now we don't have a uh, we don't have a we don't have a syntax error function. So let's write one. It's going to be the same sort of thing as our fatal function. <clears throat> And for now, it's also just going to error out. Although eventually it will, actually, let's not do that. Let's just print an error and have a separate fatal syntax error uh, function for that. And so flex test. Um, actually, I already have a test case done here. Am I running in an optimized build, I wonder? Really? Where did my toolbar disappear to? Hang on. Oh yeah. Don't do that. Okay. Okay, so that worked. Um, Let's try actually, uh, let's not, well, this is actually going to barf immediately. So let's look at that. Right, so you can see now we detect an inter integer literal overflow and, uh, when we use something that's bigger than max int. And we don't need there, so that seems to work. All right, um, uh, in addition, one thing we should change is right now, um, I'm going to use a uint64 for the actual, I'm going to call it inval because it's sort of semantically, even if it's a unsigned, it's going to for now be represented as an unsigned uh, value since we're only going to parse directly unsigned values, even if constant expressions can then make them uh, negative. So let's do it that way. And it should still work, but we should be comparing to UN max 64. Let's just make this like that. Why is it?
So now if we go to the Luxor test, we should actually not. Well, this should not overflow. But Let's convert that to Don't I have Python here? Uh, it's the doesn't trigger overflow, but if I make this one larger, it should. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's maybe factor this out a bit. That works. It didn't why? I, I thought I had warnings as errors. Well, I don't know why. It's not respecting that. I guess I hadn't enabled that. And uh, now let's say, depending on the leading character, um, if it's zero, then we want it to be uh, lower, lowercase x because I'm lower casing it case normalization, and then uh, this is hexadecimal, else we'll say invalid integer suffix and consume it. Um, if we have hexadecimal, let's set some sort of base to 16. That would normally be um, 10. And let's see here. What's the best way to do this? So maybe let's use a table for doing this stuff. Um, so I'm going to have a table of bytes. And it's indexed by ASCII characters, so I'll call it charted digit. And it's going to be the 
crazy. There's a small number of cases like this. So the idea here is just rather than doing the address math, since, we're, since we'll be handling hex digits as well as decimal digits, it's more convenient just to make this table based, which is a generally useful technique. Um, and so you should be able to do this. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we leave everything else zero. That does mean we need to distinguish a default zero from a actual zero digit zero, but we'll just do that with a check. Um, this will simplify the code, I think. So if we do this, uh, we don't, we don't, well, we need a digit, but I'll call it uh, chart a digit. And we need to validate it. So if digit is zero and stream is not zero, so in other words, if we got a zero value, but we could do something else, but this is convenient uh, because it lets us exploit the fact that the rest of the entries are zero initialized. So if we get a zero digit, but uh, the actual digit is not a literal zero, then uh, we assume that means it's an invalid character. And so we will, um, we will say uh, invalid, I guess invalid integer literal suffix. Oh, that doesn't actually, so that's, sorry, I guess because we have to actually change this whole thing up here. Um, so let's change that. So we have to, we can, I guess we can use this table for doing the recognition as well. Um, if digit, let's see, if digit equals, Probably a better way to do it, but you could do this. And then you have to say Instead of 10, it's going to be this. Something like this. Well, I guess you can't do that. So first, of course, we already have our existing Lexer test. So let's just make sure that uh, stuff still parses with decimal. And it doesn't. Not super surprising. Uh, actually, let's front load this. starts with one, uh, so that's not the case, and that doesn't trigger either. Oh, we didn't increment, of course. Actually, we can just leave that, because it's already zero. No, that's not true, we can just leave that zero. Um, so that doesn't work. 
So it parsed it, but it didn't parse the right thing. This is stress over zero. It goes to stream. See what it ends up with. Mm. Oh, six. Just sometimes just to make sure they're what I expect. So one, eight, four, 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 six, seven. So it, it overflows in the last one. Oh, it's supposed to overflow. Oh, so I guess I'm just not detecting it correctly. Okay, so that is okay. So it was working actually. So the test was working as intention. All right. Um, let's check the original. Why is it not getting there? Oh, because we don't actually have, so that's another thing we have to add. Um, we have to add space skipping. I guess so. Um, this is going to be imperfect at first. Uh, we're not going to do line counting right now, uh, just in order to get past this bug. Uh, so let's just add the obvious candidates, I suppose. Uh, is it space, new line, carriage return, tab? Vertical. Um, let's just say that. And then I will say while is space string. And I'll skip it. Incidentally, the the reason we don't just have while is space is that, I mean, I mentioned it before, but once we get a lot of these different initial character cases, we will have a single top level switch, which will often be quite unpredictable from a branch prediction point of view. So this will be sort of a uh, you know, a, a high branch out uh, switch, but then once we're in there, we just kind of, you know, it, it's it's fine. So that's kind of the idea. So let's see if that actually works. Okay, that worked, which is a little bit shocking. Um, we should verify that the overflow case is also Counted for so if I take, I guess it's a little bit easier here because we can just do this and say 
zero, 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 zero. So it should overflow. Okay, I won't even let me do it because I did it in the wrong place. Yeah, so this did overflow as expected. All right, so that's um, that's hex parsing. If you haven't seen it before, this is not the only way to do it. Um, we will probably have to return to it. Maybe there's some bugs, but uh, this will do us for now. Like I said, my general approach is in the case where we have to handle more than one thing, I will handle one more thing. I won't handle oct octal. I mean, handle, handling octal, we totally could handle octal. Um, let's handle octal. So if we just have a zero followed by some digits, then it's octal. And um, so we're not going to consume the digit. We're just going to say this is what it is. And uh, everything else is going to work. And we will make sure that um, you know if you have two, if you have greater than seven digit octal digit, um, this will catch that. So. Let's test. So what's a good octal? Uh, 42. By the way, you'll note how easy it is to test stuff with C because we can take everything in two different ways. We can use it in our context as a string or in C as an actual literal, source level literal. So let's see if this works. OK, that doesn't work. It was a little too optimistic. Um, let's just step through this a few times. So first we have the decimal, and then we have the hex. What is val? I guess there's no easy way to well, val. So that looks like the old value. First case, that's hex. We never got to the second case. Um, we'll step after the. This is the decimal case. This is the hex case. Step to here. Now we have the return value. Hmm. Let's turn down the the stub audio. It's a little bit annoying. I can't see the token val in that case. So assert token is doing the match token. Okay. 
so it's not actually advancing. What is this at? So that's that steps past that. Oh, I see. Uh, the problem is. Let's do that. Okay. So that worked. So Octal works. Let's also add something that C doesn't have, but is useful in a systems language, which is binary. Um, so it's really just going to be the same deal, but in base two. And I'm going to add a test and it's going to be like, uh, let's see. Yeah, maybe this. I guess that is an F. So that works too. This is obviously uh, a very basic test, but I don't want to, I have some stuff later for doing proper testing, which is not going to be code driven, but external with text files and stuff. So this is just really to, to, to kick the tires as we're writing it. So, um, you know, that gives us decimal, hex, octal, and binary. Um, Let's do floats, which is going to leverage internal C library stuff because doing manual float parsing with the proper rounding is very hardcore and we probably won't do it until we already know a lot about floating point from scratch when we've written an FPU and other things. So um, but let's do that all the same. I guess I should really um, write something here about floats. So let me bring up See what Sturdy says. C plus plus C. Um, right. So optional set of digits. We're only going to do decimal floats. So optional set of digits followed by a non-optional um, decimal point followed by a optional sequence of digits, if I remember correctly, followed by an exponent. Uh, an exponent can have an optional plus or minus and a sequence of digits. This has to be non-optional. So a bunch of stuff that looks like an integer, basically. Um, then a decimal point, to possible stuff after the decimal point, and then this. So the way we're going to handle this is we're going to use stir to d for the actual conversion, but we're going to scan it ourselves. So we're going to delimit it um, using our own scanning, um, which we could leverage theirs, but um, this will be a little bit less of a, uh, this will be a little bit more controlled, I suppose, in terms of the syntax. So for example, they accept stuff that we don't want to accept, like maybe some of the NAND stuff or binary floating point. 
Uh, and so we're just going to scan it ourselves to find the, the delimiters in this in, in the stream, and then we're going to pass that to the uh, start of D function. It's going to be something like this. The thing we have to figure out here is that uh, when you see a sequence of decimal digits, you don't really know whether it's the beginning of an integer literal or uh, or something else. I guess that's a problem. And I so can can you start with? So yeah, so we basically have to, before we commit to it being one or the other, we have to uh, decide, uh, we have to look for the decimal point, basically, is what it boils down to. So this is probably a little not robust for now. Um, Let's see, so maybe let's see, so what what's the best way of factoring this? Um maybe this show, stuff should be here. Um And that way we can determine kind of, so once we're at the end, basically, we're not the end. Maybe we could say something like, if base equals 10, this is a little bit, probably it won't hold in general. Um, So in this case, we're going to just restart the stream at the beginning of the token. Um, do it this way instead. And we also need to do this if something starts with a decimal point kind of nakedly. So what are we doing? Uh, we scan first an integer if it's decimal and it's followed by a dot, a decimal point, then we actually kind of ignore, uh, which I guess it's, hmm, it means the overflow is not really valid. Let's ignore that for now. I'll figure out a bigger, find out a bit better factoring of this stuff later. We should probably do the scan completely before actually doing any parsing in order to find the dot. Um, Um, back in. Um, thank you, Windows. That's totally what I want to know about right now. Um, right, so do the forward scan. And 
if that's followed by this, then I guess in either case you actually have to rewind uh, the stream and just in this case you would do it like this. So now we also need Even though I called it float val, it's because it's a semantic floating point number, but it will actually be a double, just like this is called int, but it's unit 64. Um, just like that. I know that function is not defined. Okay, so that's the only thing it's complaining about. Um, and then scan float. Let's see what was this grammar? Um, so at this point, we know we have a float, and so we don't have to do any sort of checking. We just assume this template will hold, and so we say um, uh, while is digit, we just skip stuff, um, if Um, and then if is to lower if to lower stream is this um, and consume it and there can also be an optional plus or minus which we will also consume and um, And there is a non-optional digit. And now having that, we can use str to d, which is defined in standard lib. And um, since we've already validated that it starts with a correct thing, we don't really have to cut out, cut out a substring. So we're just going to say null. Um, Then I happen to know that it will return huge val or 
minus huge val if it's kind of clamped or overflowed, I guess. And so in that case, uh, we'll just say float literal overflow and return that. So probably the new scanning we did um, didn't quite work, so let's step through that. So this is for the decimal thing. So we make a bookmark. And uh, comes to the beginning of the decimal, int. Okay, so let's just step until after that um, and then we rewind the stream and actually we don't need the bookmark let's take the start I should learn to break. Good old C. Okay, so that still works. What are we doing on time? I think I'll do a Q&A in 20 minutes, but uh, I'll try to finish this first, then we'll do the rest of the stream after. Um, I can't believe that worked. Um, the way a port works in Visual Studio. Oh, I should probably actually put this in the stream. Insert working as expected. I think that works. Um, let's do some weird stuff with exponents. So like three to the power 10. Oh, so that's actually making it in there. Uh, I guess I have to do something like this. Oh, so that is valid in C. I'd forgotten about that. Let's see, so a decimal point is not required. This is the stuff that we don't normally think about, but it makes sense, I guess.
Um, I mean, I guess the way you do that is something like this. Um, but I definitely have to change my so. actually worked, I guess. Well, I guess I didn't really check it properly. Right, so it says it can't find that. So that's just um, actually not required, apparently. The things you learn. All right. Um, I should also test some negative stuff, which I'm actually not handling right now. So, no, I guess negative stuff is not really a literal. We're not treating it as a literal, at least. So that's fine. Those are just going to be constant expression operators. All right. Um, let's say that is OK for now. And this is not intended to be complete, but um, there's also no point in doing a super crappy kind of pass through implementation. Uh, if we haven't even tried to think about it and, and at least make sure the, the basics don't work. Um, and then let's do, uh, what's next on the menu? Let's do characters. And well, characters and quoted strings. Okay. I'm actually going to make that a separate kind of token. Maybe I should just make it an integer. Is it C? Yeah, I should. So this actually points to something. I think we need more than just a token kind, we need some sort of I don't know, token modifier, let's call it. Uh, I'll still use the token prefix. So it will be like hex, binary, octal, um, char, stuff like that. Um, and that way, they, so, so yeah, that's right. We definitely need something like this because we want to basically be able to reconstitute the C, the C, um, the corresponding C code, but we don't want to just copy the strings. So we need to somehow keep some uh, data about, like, hey, this literal was actually a, uh, was actually a parsed as a character, even though maybe semantically it's just like an integer, a char you know, one byte integer or whatever. Um, so let's do that. Um, so token modifier. Well, let's just call it token mod. I guess at this point, I just should do everything in here, really. Um, Also have to make sure to set it to zero by default. 
Type def well. Let's get to say skin char. Yeah. Uh, skin store. Oh, those are just stepped out. Return values because they set up everything themselves. So let's make sure our tests still pass. All right, so we were setting up for stuff like Scanchar and um, uh, implication is you call this with the first character already equal to that, so then you can just consume it. And then hmm, okay. I guess there's, so ultimately we're going to want something like this. <clears throat> right, so let's be really crappy and say, um,
Let's see if this works. So there's all the There's all the obvious kinds of stuff. We're straight up literal tokens. So that works. I guess the more interesting would be something like a new line. Um, okay, that doesn't work. Um, so that's a good one to check out. So now we're at the oh that was actually correct um, but I needed a double escape I needed to escape the escape okay, it works and let's say we use X, which is not currently supported. Um, yeah, so we get a we get that message about the chart literal escape not being supported. All right. So again, not aiming for completeness. We we need to support like this kind of stuff for hex ascii characters but um this is definitely enough for now how we're doing on time okay 10 more minutes until i stop the q a um let's do strings which are going to be similar in a lot of ways so Um, we are going to scan strings, but not actually parse them for now uh, into an internal buffer uh, and just rely on the original string representation if we need further consultation, but we are going to scan it. Uh, and later, once we do the risk five target, we'll probably need to do a proper, a, f a full, not just scanning, but kind of interpretation of every, you know, all the escapes. And we could do that, but then we would need to allocate an internal buffer to correspond to it. And we won't really need that for now. So I think, um, let's just do a scan, uh, just scan it. So let's see, um, while we haven't reached the end of file and we haven't reached the terminating string quote, we do this, um, and if we get this far, and we, well, let's see. If we still have a string, that means we have a quote. So we'll just assert that. Uh, otherwise, we have a syntax error. And then here, we should probably pull this stuff out. Um, to call that uh, scan. I guess you could call that scan char as well. So it's a little bit of a, actually, let me just put it in for now. I won't bother factoring it out. Um,
Okay, yeah, we don't need to do any Val stuff per se. We're just going to use it for sanity checking since we're just scanning. It wouldn't be hard to build a buffer from what we're doing. It's just that uh, we might as well just scan it uh, for, for, for what we'll be doing the first few weeks and then return to it later. We have the translation tables here, so it's not going to be difficult. All right, um, so that's, does that make sense? So we, f we skip past the opening quote, and then as long as we haven't reached the end of file and we haven't seen the closing quote, uh, check for uh, embedded new line, which is illegal. Um, if we don't do this, I think probably in this case, I guess the question is, do you interpret a, a new line as someone who missed a quote? Or, yeah, let's say someone, say the quote is there. We're going to return to it later. Um, let's do it this way. So we have to skip it, otherwise it's going to loop infinitely in that case. So uh, like this. And then in this instance, it's going to check for an escape. Check if the escape is valid. Eat this. And otherwise, I guess actually we can we can factor out all of these, which makes it easier to see that this loop is actually making progress, not just looping infinitely. Um, and then this, okay, let's see what we can do about that. You know what, let's just do allocated uh, screw it. Uh, because we have stretchy buffers. Let's call this, let's just give it a name. And then for push val, stir val. I'll initialize that as to be of the compiler. Um, so then we accumulate the stretchy buff. Look at either how easy it is to do stretchy buffs. Look at it. All right, and then we zero terminate it, and we make this. And then, okay, let's do the test, and then I'll do Q and A in one minute. I feel like all of these should be in the opposite order. Okay, let's not change that for now. works. Let's do something with escapes. 
um, like a line Be double escapes or something like this. This. Okay, and that looks too. I mean, I guess you can also just to make sure the the assert macros aren't just passing stuff that shouldn't pass. Let's look at the token. So it is a stir, and it has. Mr. Valfu. All right. <clears throat> There's a lot of lexing. I think I'm going to do Q&A now. Let me just bring up the chat. All right. So, uh, yeah, let me just bring up the code. Um, so yeah, that, that's going to be, except for a quick maybe five minute Q&A, that's going to be it for the main, uh, the main video. After this, I will take like a five minute break. I'll continue recording immediately after, and then uh, we'll just, uh, we'll finish the lecture and then we'll do the parser and the AST, and it'll take the rest of the day, I figure. But hopefully we can keep up this kind of pace, which has been pretty good. So uh, any questions, please add me so I can see you guys. Oh, someone's asking about standalone zero as a decimal integer literal. I mean, I, let, let me not context switch back to the code, but uh, I'm sure there are bugs like that where maybe I'm not handling certain cases. All right. So one person, I, I do want to address it. Someone's saying something about L1 the way I'm using it. So LL1 refers to the token look ahead. I'm not doing token look ahead. I'm doing character look ahead. And a lot of languages that are LL1 at the token level are definitely not LL1 at the character level. And in fact, one of the good reasons for having separation between scanner and parser is so that you can have localized uh, you know, tactical look ahead at the character level, but then not have that infect the whole parser so the parser can be LL1 at the token level. So when people say L1, they basically always mean at the token level, not at the character level. Most languages have issues along the lines of what you just saw with the integers versus floats. Integers versus floats are actually a notorious example. You, if you completely merge your integer and float parser, you can uh, not have to do the, the, back scan, the, the backtracking. But uh, there's no real, uh, you know, it, most people split them up like I'm doing, I think, from what I've seen. Uh, hex table uppercase E. Oh yeah, good catch. Oh, someone's saying octal literal. Yeah, I'll check that out. Uh, someone's asking about multi-line strings and whether Ion will support it. I think that will probably be supported, to be honest, because I feel like that's uh, one of the biggest issues with I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen people who like to keep stuff in a single C file. I like to keep things in a single C file as well, but using C style strings makes that really painful, like for shaders and stuff. So I think multi-line strings are probably going to be there. They're pretty easy to synthesize to C strings by just having, you know, implicit line concatenation and, and have some new lines there as well. All right. Um, just going to do some scroll to see if I can see stuff that people asked. Um, 
Regarding the unbounded look ahead for the int versus slope determination, I mean, the easy way to make that bounded is to just make a cap on how far ahead you can scan based on the maximum possible length. This is just really what I'm doing for now because it's convenient. Uh, we'll revisit later, so don't get too caught up on what I'm doing when I'm trying to code at full speed. Uh, all of this will be improved and refactored, but uh, I think what we're doing for now is not too, too bad. Um, let's see here. Uh, someone's asking, for the second compiler pass, how will you resolve the declarations in an order-independent way? Will you register them in the first pass, or is there another technique to achieve this? Uh, basically, the, the first pass is going to produce an AST, and then the second pass is going to do a dependency-directed walk. And so it walks everything in declaration order recursively in order to fully resolve that entity. So if you're, for example, if you're trying to resolve a type declaration and in the and in uh, in the course of resolving that, in other words, resolving the fields and the field types, you find that you refer to a type from a declaration that has not been resolved, then you recursively go and resolve that. And so by the time you return from that recursion, that has been resolved and has been entered into the, you know, in the, in the linear order. Uh, and of course, as you do that, you have to be mindful of cyclic dependencies so that you don't recurse. So there's no cyclic recursion, but you can detect that very easily by just setting a few bits in the uh, symbol tables to, to check when you're filling in the declaration uh, the first time. Uh, and if you do that, basically, it's like a topological sort, but it's intermingled with the actual resolution of all the different entity declarations. And so that's what I'm planning on doing. It's a pretty simple recursive algorithm. But uh, we'll get there. For, for, for today, we'll just generate the AST and probably dump the AST if we get that far. But uh, the actual resolution of the AST will be later this week and all the type checking and associated uh, processing. All right. Yeah, someone's saying that this is a bit simpler than I thought as well. I think people blow systems level problems up to be much scarier than they are. I mean, the fact is that once you start solving big problems, uh, complex problems, things get more, com I mean, like if you work on real world problems, there's a lot of complexity uh, you can't really get rid of. Um, but I think if you build things up in simple stages, then at every step you have a good idea of what you're doing and you're building on a solid foundation and that's what we're gonna try to do. Uh, and so in, in that case, uh, if, if you're along for the ride, things usually look a lot simpler than if you arrive five years into a project and you're just seeing the final result of a long evolution. But certainly when we're building things up from scratch like this and we're trying to keep things simple and straightforward, it should look simple because uh, it is. But yeah, I, I agree. I mean, when you're approaching it like this, it should be, uh, it should be pretty simple. All right, I don't see a lot of new questions. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, cut off the recording and then restart it immediately after. Let's give it a few more minutes and then we will cut for a break. Oh crap, oh I did record. I thought I didn't record for some reason. I did. The, the, the thing about, so, so, so let me respond to the person earlier talking more about the integer versus float scan ahead. The thing is, we're going to be calling str to d anyway, and str to d is going to have to rescan the string. And so regardless of whether we scan it first, as long as we are doing some of the scanning, whether we're doing the look ahead, I mean, anyway, it, it, it's not really a big problem. Uh, if you're doing buffered reading rather than just having the whole buffer in memory at once, you have to be a little more careful. I think I talked about that in one of the first streams, but it's very easy actually to handle this sort of bookmarking, even with buffered reading. You just have to make sure that you, as long as there's a bookmark set, you can't really flush out that part of the buffer so that you can allow resetting to it. Um, but in lectures, you do sometimes see this kind of thing. Uh, and you can also bound the look ahead, like I said, by just 
you know, saying that, I don't know, I don't know how many digits you can have. And it was like the largest 64 bit. Um, I mean, here's one way of thinking about it. If you've seen more uh, digits than could occur in a non overflowing 64 bit uh, integer literal, I guess it must be sort of a float or something. I, I mean, that's not totally true, but like you can probably do some stuff to cut off uh, the look ahead. Anyway, I think what we're doing, this is the cleanest separation by far, but we'll revisit it later. All right, I'm not seeing new questions, so I'll um, I'll stop the stream for now, uh, or the recording and the stream, and then I will come back in um, a few seconds. So thanks for watching, and uh, hopefully, I mean, not to say that all of this is complete, but hopefully you saw some pretty simple techniques for doing C-style lexing. C, C, lexing in C of C, basically. All right.